Excellent. Welcome. Thank you for dialing in today. We know that um, for anyone working in colleges and universities at whatever level of the university you represent, this is a very busy time of year for you. So whether you are uh, delivering finals, preparing finals, preparing for fiscal year end, commencements, whatever it may be, you made it. Congratulations. And um, we're glad that you took a few moments of your day to join us for this conversation. And most certainly congratulations to all of the students that will be graduating in the coming days and weeks at your campuses. My name is Kathleen Scott. I have the pleasure to serve as the Vice President for Leadership Development and Partnerships at the American Association of State Colleges and Universities, also known as ASCU. I'm coming to you today from a very foggy, kind of drizzly day in the nation's capital, and I'm joined by two special guests who I'll introduce to you in just a moment. So most of you know that ASCU is a membership organization. We represent nearly 400 public regional colleges across the nation and beyond. In fact, I think one of our participants today is from one of our members in Mexico. So, um, buenos tardes. Um, we deliver value through thought leadership, leadership development programming, creating communities of experience, advocacy, and student success innovation. And we couldn't do what we do without the support of our corporate partners. We have a number of organizations that we work with that support our work and help to deliver thought partnership and value to our membership and academic search is one of those and actually one of our most special corporate partners we have um, a long history of working together in partnering to serve um, the the members of the ask you community um, academic search helps build stronger organizations by partnering with colleges and universities to assemble the best teams possible they are hands-on and financial supporters of our Ask You Leadership Development programs, helping to build competency and diversity among current and aspiring leaders. And I will tell you several weeks ago in preparation for this call, I was talking with Sean Hartman, who you'll meet in a moment, and he shared stories of candidates gone wild and how crazy a time it is in the hiring process, recruitment and hiring process in higher ed. And so we agreed that this was a story that needed to be told and had some conversation around it. We thought that you would all find value in hearing latest trends and tips and best practices. So you are joining us today for part one of a two-part webinar series focused on higher education and the workplace landscape. Today, we'll bring you a conversation on navigating the turbulent recruiting and hiring landscape. And our speakers have put a lot of thought into both perspectives of the hiring process. So both the perspective some of you bring as a hiring manager, if you're president or provost or someone else looking to bring great talent onto your team, what are some things that you need to be aware of in this crazy turbulent time, as well as if you're a candidate in the market ready for your next step, what are the watch outs that you want to keep in mind. So we'll talk about trends, challenges, and tips and um, welcome your conversation, your input, your feedback, and your questions. We've carved a lot of time for you to have that conversation today. So now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our panelists for the day. First, we are joined by Dr. Sean Hartman, Chief Operating Officer from Academic Search. And Sean oversees the day-to-day -day operations, which is not a normal eight to five day as maybe that used to be in, in years ago, but a 24 seven, 365 search process um, that Academic Search oversees. Um, and Sean has a background in student affairs. Joining Sean is Frederica Hayes, Associate Vice President of Human Resources. Frederica represents an ASCU member campus, Ferris State University from the great state of Michigan. Her philosophy is to do what is best for students and supporting students requires meeting the needs of faculty and staff, including recruit, recruiting and retaining a workforce that not only represents the students that we serve, but has a strong desire to place student needs first in the decision making process. And I know firsthand how hard the HR teams have worked over the last two years to keep our faculty, students and staff safe and working and, and, and navigating this crazy time. So Frederica, um, for all of us in higher ed, thank you for the work that you've done to serve your campus and your colleagues in HR have done across the nation. We're looking forward to an engaging conversation. We have chat enabled, so you can weigh in on comments or reflections in the chat and the Q&A feature in Zoom enabled. So if you have questions you would like to hear more about or have specific questions for either of our panelists, we ask that you use the Q&A feature. 
And with that, I am delighted to hand the mic to my friend and colleague, Sean Hartman. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's, it's great to spend some time with you this afternoon. Um, as we were thinking about the design of the program, it's, we really did want to highlight both sides of what the hiring landscape is. There's certainly an executive search where we're really looking at much more kind of dean levels and above, uh, senior administrators, heads of units. Um, and so there, th that's kind of one world. Um, and I think a lot of, you know, I spend my time in that world. But there's this whole world that's happening on campuses that you as hiring authorities um, or working with campuses that aren't using search firms just need to be aware of um, and some of the challenges. And that's why I'm so excited to have Frederica with us that you know, has this lived experience of kind of these both worlds. And we'll talk a little bit um, about, we have some of the same behaviors going on um, <laughs> in executive search that we do in campus hiring as well. Um, but you know, we'll spend just a little time talking about some of the macro issues. Um, and then again, breaking it down, what's happening on campus, what's happening in executive search, um, and then just kind of navigating uh, this new whatever. I, I, I hate to say new normal, because I don't think it is a normal yet, um, and probably won't be for a little while. So. Um, Frederica, I'll turn it over to you for any some opening comments as well. So we're, we're a university that uses both internally HR and then search firms. What we're finding now in this crazy hiring market, because it is crazy. I've never seen anything like this, and I've had a lot of years in the human resource area and education. Um, we, we have to use both. We have to use all resources. We have to change what we used to do because it's not working. And the flexibility and the need to change is just high. One search no, no longer matches how the other search went. So changing that, changing on the campus, particularly when you have a lot of built-in procedures and processes, it's very necessary now. So what I call, what we do is nimble. Changes from moment to moment sometimes. Sean? Thanks. So, so let's, I mean, some of these trends, macro trends will be no surprise if you've, if you've watched the news at all um, over the course of the last few months, um, or you know, this data comes from our friends at Coupa, um, who you'll hear a little bit more from uh, next week. But uh, this just gives you a sense of the impact that our campuses have had over these last couple of years, kind of the, the peaks, the valleys, and now coming back up, but still understaffed, still below headcounts of where we were. Um, and we'll talk about, you know, is that by design? Is that by simply we can't find folks to fill those positions? Um, but, you know, at this point, we're still below our headcounts. Um, and, you know, in the tumult of everything already, then you're down staff um, and you're trying to do things, particularly um, in, in HR, you know, we see a lot of, we're working with a lot of campuses that they're recruiting their own recruiters internal, our staff liaisons, our, you know, our campus partners are down and those recruiters are handling multiples of the amount of searches um, that they used to, um, which again, leads to some of the challenges. Um, we'll talk a little bit. Um, again, no surprise to most of us that have worked in higher education that the salary trends for higher education are not as robust as other sectors in general. And the complicating factor now is inflation um, and kind of the buying po power of those dollars um, in terms of how does that play out. And so um, we're seeing that, we're seeing some of the inflation um, pressures are wage prices. Um, and we'll, again, we'll talk about this in a second, a little bit of kind of how that is impacting the search process, internal equity um, on campuses um, as well. And we, we were just talking about, you know, this slide really reflects the, the amount of job openings. Now, the Bureau of Labor Statistics doesn't break it down for, for higher education specific, but I think most of us would probably agree 
that this is probably what we're feeling um, on campus um, as well. We have almost twice as many openings now um, as we did just two years ago. And that's a, that's a, huge, that's a huge change um, in terms of um, just how we, how we need to recruit how in, in Frederick, how we be nimble um, when you have so many openings. Um, so Frederica, you're living this on, on campus and, and how is this playing out kind of for you? So uh, for us, um, I've, I've not seen the volume of openings as what I'm seeing now, and it's from all levels. And we are in a more rural area. We're an hour away from what I would call a big city, Grand Rapids. So we even have that struggle where people um, are hesitant. Well, first we had people hesitant to move during COVID. And then it seemed like last fall, it just, the, the cap went off and all type of movement. So we have seen, you know, major searches. Uh, I was sharing earlier as we were preparing, half of our deans are interims right now. We've never had that type of volume. And we, we close one search or we have multiple search. We're, we're literally closing one and starting the next uh, for, for deans. We just recently uh, announced uh, a new president. So we also at the same time, our provost is less than two years here. Now we have a new president who will start. We have had major searches. The division that I'm in, admin and finance, um, my boss was hired in uh, July of 19. I came in November of 19. I'm now number two in seniority on his staff. More than half of his staff has turned over. And it's, it's a number of factors. It's retirement, people moving to other jobs once things open. So it's a constant uh, hire process. There, we've not had a slow point. Uh, other than our time during COVID when we had a period of time when we were all shut down and we had about four months where we weren't doing any hiring. So, so that leads to, as we're trying to take care of all these things, what are we noticing uh, from uh, our candidates? And I will also say from our internal behavior, because it's not just the candidates that we're talking about. Uh, we have candidates lined up for interviews who are supposed to come to campus or even on Zoom calls and the night before, we're not coming. They've changed their mind. So we're at the finalist stage. Uh, but we have that earlier in the stages for some of our searches where people agree to interview and they just don't show up. Our search committee, and, and this is very important to talk about, is the search committee behavior because they represent us and they represent us for that new candidate that we really want to come here. But you'll have search committees who, you know, they're not committed to the process. They don't show up. They don't participate. So all those type of things are going on and they make impressions on whether it's the campus community or the candidate. Salary expectations. You know, I can't speak <laughs> to some of the struggles we've had. Uh, we were not a university that posted our ranges. We now post that range. Um, and we'll still have people say, well, I need more. And we all know that delicate balance we have of equity among our campus. And I find that I'm now constantly doing compensation reviews. It's we do not have among our, among our administrative staff, we don't have established ranges. So I'm probably doing compensation reviews through Coupa, that on demand, two to three times a week now not just for the job search, but for the people who are still here because we've had to change the range for the people we're hiring. And that flows through the university. And it's, it's kind of hard to do that in a shrinking student environment and shrinking, and fun, and shrinking funding. Uh, relocation, you know, we can't, we've, we have housed more faculty and staff in our dorms we now have a dorm set aside as interim housing because they can't find housing. Our police chief has been in uh, housing for six months in, in the dorm. So we literally 
set a dorm aside for faculty and staff for interim housing. And then you do have some of those votes of no confidence because those kind of things go on, but then campus bad press. Uh, we had two very public incidences since COVID. Um, we had a, a professor who went on YouTube and called our students a, a few names and that they were COVID spreaders and everything else. And uh, students dropped, parents called, candidates said, what are you going on? And it actually is in a college where we had a dean search and the dean was like, what am I coming into? So those are some factors where I think people have come out of COVID, in my opinion, being much more vocal about opinions and those opinions can affect what is going on on your campus and beyond. So this delayed decision-making process, you know, candidates want more time, search committees want more time, hiring authorities want more time, and that's, we have lost candidates because of our, we've got to think about it again. So from an HR standpoint, when we're setting that timeline for searches, whether it's internal or external with a search committee or a search uh, consultant, we are setting those decision dates right from the front so people understand that we can't delay. Uh, we're going through a search right or we're closing a search right now. Um, and it's something our office didn't work closely to monitor. It was an internal search but we will be putting in place where we search. The search chair took six months to respond. And then he said, well, nobody's interested. Well, you didn't contact them. We, the job was posted in November and we're talking the end of April. You didn't contact them. You can't do that. I'm, I'm not sure you could do that before, but you certainly cannot do that in today's market of just people are looking. And when they're ready to go and make that decision, they're ready to go and you will lose good candidates if you're not prepared. So we have um, set up where right after those final interviews, within the next day, the search committee, it's pre-scheduled as we're scheduling interviews. It's also scheduled on their calendar for the decision-making meeting. So do that right from the beginning because we, you have to. Candidates are, candidates are valuable right now in this market. Um, increased focus on um, DEI. So not only is that important to your campus, but I hear candidates ask, what is your DEI? And they look for not just the words, but they look for the activity. So if you're doing a lot of things, make sure your web page reflects those things. Make sure your public documents because I do find, which is great, candidates are searching us out just as much as we're searching them out. So make sure whatever you're reflecting and want to reflect from for your campus that your public's information reflects that too. So we're updating those things because I find candidates are asking us more questions than what they have done in the past. Thanks, Frederica. And just along with the camp, we're experiencing many of these same things, it, it, just in a different level. Um, so we'll start with the last, the, the DEI. You know, our candidates are asking us, are they truly committed um, to their DEI initiatives? Is there more than just a worksheet? Is there more than just pictures on the website? Um, and they're really trying to, to answer that if, there, if there's a focus there. Um, you know, the, the market churn is definitely true. Um, multiple and competing officers, but we've also, for the first time, so I've been doing search about seven and a half years now. Um, I've supervised somewhere around 900 searches in that time, um, maybe closer to a thousand. And I have never seen um, home, home institution counter offers like I've seen this cycle. Um, the number of institutions that have counter offered their own team members. Um, and, and that's another workshop on strategy, equity. How does that impact? Uh, there's a lot of questions there to, to, to un, unravel, but you know, it's, it's a new trend. Um, 
And so again, all of these things um, that your own campus um, folks face, we then face as search consultants. So the kind of the bad press, the votes of no confidence, um, you know, how do we deal with those? Um, I think one of the benefits of, of us as a search firm is no, not all votes of no confidence are the same. <laughs> They're not, you know, just because you have one doesn't mean, you know, the, the candidate is um, dead in the water, but it, that's a way for us to help um, really kind of tell the story here. What are we talking about? Um, you know, there are, there's at least one system that took a vote of no confidence against all of their presidents because the presidents negotiated the faculty contract. Um, and so again, they, they play out in different ways um, in that. And so, um, so for those of you putting questions in, we will, we will circle back to those. I promise we'll come back to, uh, to a couple of those. Um, so Frederica, I think we, yep. we started on some of those and some yes. of those very specific. Yeah. So as I talked about the salary compression, you know, we're, we're having to address in order to get a candidate, we're looking at our pay differently, but we have to come back and talk about who's here on staff because I certainly don't want to fill a position. And then because we're not addressing salary, create a new position to fill, uh, which inadvertently we've done that a couple of times. So we're paying much more closer attention from an HR standpoint now, when we go to post for that hiring manager, um, I am pulling ranges. This is what we're paying on campus for this position right now. And they've, we've never looked at that before. So pulling up, this is where our people are now, including not just looking at the salary, but looking the length of time in the position and the length of time at the, at, uh, at the employer, because those are factors that you should look at and explain. So someone you know, someone um, hired last fall, there's a reason why you're in that, but I shouldn't hire another person in that same position with the same type of experience more than you were last fall. There, there hasn't been that much change. Uh, length of the hiring process, yes, we have compressed some things, we've changed some things. We have a very specific uh, process for EO review for all hiring. And for some positions, uh, where, you know, it's this very formal, you got to submit a spreadsheet and so on. We have to work with uh, EO and they're now at the table with the search committee in reviewing candidates to speed up that process. That takes five to seven days off the process, but that used to be, you submit the worksheet and they respond in five to seven days. Now they're at the, at the table when you were reviewing candidates. Desire for remote work. Um, or what I call hybrid work. Um, can't explain how that's affected us. Uh, um, yes, we all did it because we had to uh, for a period of time. And in, in the state of Michigan, we were actually sent home from the state for about four months where no one could work on campus except essential services. And our students were, were sent home too. Uh, we had some people who didn't want to come back, and we're still working through some of that. I actually just had to process. Um, she resigned, but it was almost a year. We kept saying, come back, come back, come back. And finally, it was like, if you don't come back by April 1, we're going to terminate you. And um, before we terminated her, <laughs> she quit. But it was right on uh, that last day of March that she quit. Because people keep saying, I, I can do my work better at home, but we're a service industry. Our students are here. There was a difference when we weren't here to the difference we are now. But you do need to look at things. So we have some hybrid policies. We're looking at positions by position, some criteria to develop or to evaluate whether that is appropriate remote work. But we are also saying our first responsibility are students. And the students, if they walk up to a desk, they need a person. Uh, so that's our first responsibility. But we're working through its very different policies now and, and procedures and, and review. And, um, but you have to be responsive. 
otherwise the market will hurt you because there are places that are allowing more remote work than we are. And people want to have that flexibility. But we always have to remember service of students is first. And as long as we keep that conversation going, that students are first, we can typically work through some of those things. You know, yeah, I can't speak, Sean will probably speak to the market because, you know, whether you're using a search firm or you're internal, the market is the market. And it's very different right now. And we've talked about some of the other things, legislative changes, um, poor candidate behavior, and unrealistic expectations of the hiring authority. I do have to have some conversations. We're having conversations about credentials. I know we're higher ed, but does every position need a college degree? We are just now starting those type of conversations, IT particularly. Um, if you're going to assist on these college degrees, you're going to struggle with IT right now. And we're going to have to look at some other things because with the college degree, they're going to businesses and we're not competing salary wise with businesses. And that is not our competition. So we've got to look at some other things. Sean. Thanks. Um, before we move on to the, the, the search side, the uh, executive search side, the kind of length of job posting um, conversation. I am having more, more and more conversations <laughs> with fro folks like Frederica or others that we will only take searches if they review materials as they come in that we know the pool is gonna be an exceptionally small pool, that it is gonna be very tight and likely the candidates of quality will be fielding multiple offers. Um, someday I will come up with a creative marketing way to talk about it, but I currently call it, call it the bird in the hand recruiting. That as we get the candidates in the pool and they are committed to moving forward, to initiate a process kind of immediately with them, getting them interviewed, at least getting them connected to campus so we can build that relationship immediately. Um, because the kind of the traditional model of waiting till a certain deadline, reviewing all the materials, taking a couple more weeks to, um, you know, to then in, invite folks just in this market just simply isn't working. Um, and it goes back to some of what Frederica was saying about just the delays, the timeline issues, the good candidates have moved on, um, especially in what I would call those mid-level opportunities. So the executive directors, the directors of centers, the, um, the IT, you know, the AVP levels, those folks will, will have multiple and competing opportunities. Um, and we wanna move forward um, kind of as quickly um, as we can. Um, some of the things we're seeing on the on the search side, executive search side of the house, the the COVID fatigue is real, and we're all feeling it. I don't think probably anybody on this webinar right now um, feels the same as they did, you know, kind of at this point, maybe two or three years ago. It's just it's been an exhausting couple of years, um, and especially for those of you that have lived this intensity um, for the last two years, and so. We're seeing that play out in some unique ways, uh, particularly in terms of what is the campus looking for? Um, what are the expect expectations? Um, and one of the unique trends that I've seen over this last 18 months is the value congruence between the campus, the search committee, and the hiring authority um, being on very, very kind of different pages. Um, and that you know, has affected finding a right candidate. Um, this is my personal feeling. So, uh, you know, throw any tomatoes you have at me for this, but Zoom has been a really great opportunity to expand access and equity um, to, to the search process. The old model of flying into an airport, the airport interviews, you know, not everybody had the resources to do that. Um, not everybody had the time or the family child care or the host of a bazillion other reasons why they could just kind of pick up and go to an airport. You know, you fly in for a day, you interview for 15 minutes and you fly home an hour and 15 minutes and you fly home the next day. That's a huge time commitment for kind of a 75 minute 
um, block. The flip side though is, and again, in my personal belief, it's now a little bit easier to explore these opportunities and be a little less committed. If you were gonna put childcare in place, if you were gonna make family arrangements, you know, care for parents and all the kind of things you would need to do to fly in, you were much more likely to be committed to that opportunity. Now, there's just not the same level of commitment. And we're seeing that play out. Um, Frederica and I have had this conversation, the candidates disappearing from the search process um, without little to any notice. Um, the multiple and competing offer, um, offers, we've talked a little bit about hiring windows. Um, <laughs> I have had seven calls in the past week asking if we could put uh, cabinet level members in place in less than two months. Um, and some, some VP searches do absolutely move a little faster than others. Um, five of those were either provost or vice president for academic affairs positions. Um, and depending on the campus, particularly at our state um, institutions, that is simply not a realistic window. Um, and at this point, people have made commitments. And so um, the windows and in, in what it really does is affect from the search side of the house, um, the recruitment windows, the ability to reach out and follow up and keep chatting with folks um, to encourage them um, to apply. Um, you know, the, we're starting to see some of the consolidation of positions in executive search where VP responsibilities may be taking on where there might've been an AVP or director or others. We're seeing those folded into particularly the VP roles a little bit more. So this kind of consolidation, maybe the, the controller role has been, you know, difficult to fill. And so they're now rolling some of those con controller um, pieces into the, the CFO um, search. And so that, you know, so we're starting to see some of that. Um, it, those of you that work with search firms, you know that they, everyone is extremely busy um, right now. Um, again, go, going back to that churn. And so um, one of the challenges is when things get off track, when committees take an extra two or three weeks to approve the profile or the, you know, the interviews get pushed back a couple of weeks, it begins to become a real challenge just from a scheduling perspective um, for that. And so, um, you know, there, there are a couple questions, um, you know, interviewing um, on campus. Um, the, we have definitely see the airport interview, I think for most positions is probably gone. Um, the time and expense is just, not proportional. Um, there are still some campuses that are challenged by that um, and we'll work through them, but I think the majority have moved to completely virtual um, interviews for that initial phase. Um, typically at state institutions where you can't do confidential searches, we've also seen that, you know, the finalists being invited in the kind of the traditional end of the, the process. Um, we, we, there are versions of that that we've seen. Um, you know, maybe where you conduct um, all of the finalist interviews virtually and then invite candidates back one at a time um, to meet with the campus. And it's a little less formal of a, of a day than say the kind of back to back to back, you know, day and a half um, schedule that we used to see. Um, but um, we're gonna talk about this in a little bit. I think that the challenge with interviews is the reframing for the campuses that because of the demand, because of the churn, how do we turn those from a, I'll use a pejorative, a grilling of the candidates that we wanna get everything out of them to demonstrating mm -hmm. we want them to come to campus. Um, that we've you know so far been so impressed and we wanna continue the conversation and wanna put our best um, foot forward. So Frederica, back to you for tips yeah. for some of our campus hiring authorities. So again, be flexible. One, you know, one example where I talked about is, you know, we've got a pretty standard process actually by board policy about EO review, changing how they're involved. Um, our screening 
working with people where, you know, HR's in there, we're helping screen to move things along. We're checking things through the application process to move things along, um, be more involved. So one thing I say, you uh, can't be passive anymore. <laughs> you have to be very proactive and, and engaged in the searches in order to process them through. Understand pools may be small. Um, had two or three conversations this spring where we used to get 50 and uh, this, the search had 20 and they're like, it's not big enough. And I'm like, I have some that are five and you had good people in that 20. We're not going to hold for 50. <laughs> you need to move forward. Uh, so there's, you know, lots of questions about how we prepare the search committee and the search chair that this is very different because they have expectations about it just used to be different before COVID. So they're not engaged with the hiring process and the recruitment process every day. So what they're seeing, they think is something wrong where we have to explain this, and I hate to use it, new normal, but it's in, we it may not be normal, but it is today. It's very different. Hospitality for candidates. I can't explain how much where we reach out as soon as we see a viable candidate because we want them to come and be interested in fairs. We start talking about fairs, start talking up uh, and sending information, you know, some of our newsletters. So we kind of put them in a pool and start communicating with them as if they're here already. So they see that engagement. Reframe the interview, I would say 100%. It's very much so you're interviewing each other and it's not that formal sit down where you're firing questions. What we have moved in some of our interviews, you're not at that formal table anymore. It may be a round circle of chairs. You, you just have to present yourself as more welcoming. Yep, demonstrating the DEI. Um, so again, as we talked about, it's more than the words. Can they see actions on campus? Part of our communication that we're talking about where we engage with the candidates more is we talk about our activities. We talk about our campus climate team. Uh, we talk about how we engage with staff and students. So it's an earlier conversation. Can't express, don't delay. You'll, you'll lose good candidates. And make sure you're ready. We do a lot of pre-work now because we don't have time. And can we answer authentically, why should I come here? And you're, you need to prep your search committee to answer that question because at different times, so have different interactions with the candidate and you don't wanna go off the message. Thanks, Frederica. Um, you know, a little bit about, you know, for, for those of you that are engaged in executive search, um, certainly preparation for the search process and ASCU has a number of great programs. We partner with, um, with ASCU on several of those programs and, uh, and support them financially and through presentations. And so preparation absolutely is, you know, one of the keys for a successful search. Um, in the COVID fatigue era, um, we are definitely seeing um, some challenges with quality of materials. Um, people are rushing through them. The materials aren't quite as um, thoughtful or thorough um, as they used to be, which presents a challenge on the search committee side. Do you allow for that or not? Um, and that's a separate conversation um, for the search committee. Um, I, the leadership programs I've been working with this year, I have spent a lot of time asking, if you take this opportunity, where are you going to find your joy? There is so many demands and so many challenges that higher ed is facing. And there, you know, while it's amazing and uh, such great work, it is tough. I don't have to say that to any of you um, to reinforce that. Where are you finding your joy? If you're going to take that opportunity, where are you going to get your joy from on top of all the other um, challenges um, you're going to have to, um, to face? Um, being honest and direct. 
Um, it's an interesting um, challenge that we've had this year from a search executive search side of things in that my spouse no longer wants to move it has become one of the number one decline um, issues we've had. And is that in some ways I feel it's kind of the dog ate my homework excuse a little bit. Um, Cause we're not going to question your spouse. We're not going to follow through. Um, but ask us your questions. You know, there was a question about um, in the chat, you know, about DEI, ask your questions, make sure you get those answered, make sure you feel comfortable um, getting your questions answered. And if it requires some more time or requires HR or the search team to, to spend some more time, we all will, because we want you to, to have a great opportunity. Um, so if you need more information, ask for it. Everybody's tired. Um, and so just some grace and, um, you know, particularly on the search side, we see things like we can't always tell a candidate what's happening um, on from the other side. And, you know, we try and, you know, stay with us. It's moving, but we can't always share what's going on internally. Um, and but it's not always negative, too. Um, you know, we've had we've had searches that were down to the conclusion and the hiring authority gets COVID or we had a horrible uh, a hiring authority that one of their children was a, it was in a horrific car accident um, and they had to step out. So there are, are situations that aren't necessarily negative that impact um, kind of those timelines. Um, being flexible again, reminding to, to take care of yourself um, in this process. These processes, especially if you're in a full, um, a full search mode where you may be doing um, you know, a few interviews a month, it is really hard to keep going. Um, and, you know, depending on, you know, where you land and, um, you know, the challenge is there will only be one successful candidate. There are always lots of good candidates, but there will only be one successful. And so it's a lot easier to say than live, but it really isn't necessarily your fault. Um, it's just the pools, you know, were, were that strong. Um, and again, back to the leadership and preparation, if there's anything you can do to review and expand your portfolio, to, to move into new areas, to experience new things, um, people want the cross campus, um, involvement and really kind of an understanding of more than just their particular subject matter. Um, and so I think, you know, continuing to find those opportunities in mentors, in the leadership development programs, um, just is good for kind of you and your intellectual engagement, um, but also from a, from a search perspective. So I know that was a lot of chatting. So Kathleen, what kind of, I know there's a lot of questions in the chat that. Um, yeah, let me see if I can help it. moderate. First of all, thank you. Great tips, great um, best practices and great war stories because it is a crazy time out there. It looks like we may have lost Frederica. We're hoping she'll join in, but you're going to be the um, fly solo for a moment as, as we look at some of the comments and, and questions in the chat. So you just talked a moment about candidates being forthright and questions about culture and equity and inclusion efforts on campus. Can you speak to, this was one of the questions, can you speak to what employers should be doing? And, and Frederica made a few comments about what they're doing at Ferris in terms of telling their DEAI story and the culture, the programs, the practices, how they're operationalizing values that may show up on a website. But what does it really mean um, for a workplace? Because those are um, top of mind questions and something we all need to be paying um, close attention to not just the language, but the, the, the behaviors behind it. Absolutely. Um, so I think there, there's kind of two angles. One is, is the story. Um, you know, we look for opportunities where we fit with the mission of the institution. Um, and so making sure you understand that mission and how does that mission impact the DEI stories that you're telling. And so, you know, if there's already something, if, you know, in place, if you've done annual reports on DEI, if there anything you can provide your candidates to really demonstrate the lived experience of mm -hmm. DEI on the campus is, is really critical. And it may not require rewriting something. There may already be a report or a climate survey or other, other kind of built-in processes 
that you can simply, um, you know, kind of re, you know, change the tense of a few, some sentences and, and kind of repackage that will be, you know, interesting um, for candidates. Um, and that's, you know, and that's easier said than done on some campuses. Mm -hmm. um, some campuses have dedicated teams that are responsible for this that you could possibly partner with. Um, others don't have dedicated staff members um, or it's, you know, it's not some, somebody's sole portfolio. And so um, trying to find out opportunities where you can do that. Um, there's a couple, um, one's escape, um, the UC system and the CSU systems have implemented um, really good trainings for search committees hmm. um, that are really kind of robust and, and not just bias, but kind of treatment throughout. Um, I think it's uh, University of Oregon has um, implemented a, a search committee um, buddy, I think is what they call it. That, don't hold me to that, but it's basically someone that's tasked with observing the equity um, in the committee um, hmm. and being trained to raise issues of equity or raise issues um, of concern on hmm. either how candidates are presenting or training. So I think um, you know, living it out and, and taking some of those small steps for that, um, again, demonstrating, demonstrating, you know, it's, it's a DEI demonstration is no different when we ask to demonstrate values and qualities of our other programs. Uh, mm -hmm. We need to do it there um, as well. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you for that. Welcome back, Frederica. We're, we're kind of diving into some of the questions and <laughs> glad that your, your, your Zoom interruption was, was brief. Glad to have you back. So um, we, we only have another um, 10 minutes or so before we, we wind down. And, um, but I think this DE, there's another question regarding DEI while we're on it. Uh, we could take another several hours to discuss. So maybe some best practices and highlights of successes that you're seeing on when campuses, particularly ask you institutions may not have formal DEI offices and HR teams are stretched just for all the reasons that you both just finished talk, sharing with us the challenges. What are some things that you're seeing that are best practices to ensure an equitable campus experience for, for all? Any, any uh, you, you mentioned a couple of, of training and resources that perhaps we can um, include in the follow-up materials to our attendees, but any any other um, fairness, equitable successes out there you could call out? So I would say here on campus, one of the things that we've done is through our campus climate team is make sure a lot of education occurs. We also have a requirement that everyone goes through search committee training and that search committee training includes a lot of information regarding um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. The other thing is be prepared to talk to your candidates. They're going to ask questions. Mm -hmm. You know, um, even and particularly when you get to the finalists, you have diverse candidates. They're, they're going to ask you questions about your community. Uh, they're going to ask questions about resources they have mm -hmm. and be prepared for that. So on our um, diversity, equity, and inclusion page, we have businesses, we have daycare, we have those type of things, but make sure someone on your committee is able to speak to that on that search committee. We are not a very diverse campus um, in terms of the uh, 15 public uh, universities, fairs in terms of uh, diverse staff is typically 13th or 14th in the mm -hmm. state. Uh, be honest about it, but be, but be honest about your efforts and make sure, because we don't have enough people that you even have diverse diversity on search committees, mm -hmm. make sure you're just talking about it. And I think honesty is the best thing and that you're working towards it. Great, great advice. Another question related, Federico or Sean, to the search committee um, is regarding ethical behavior of search committee members, how we um, ensure that they're following policy and addressing issues of favoritism or people they may know in the pool. Any, any tips on, on how to navigate that? So we have mimicked something that the search committee firms, everyone signs a statement. We talk about, you know, if you have prior knowledge, of the, of the candidate, we talk about what that prior knowledge is and whether it would be a conflict. So as we're selecting those search committees, um, we're, we're very clear about, you know, process and procedures. And, you know, you still have people who, I'm gonna go do my own reference check and it may not be the proper reference check. And so we talk about those things. 
Um, but we also talk about honesty. If you know something about a candidate that would make them not the best, please speak up to the chair and to HR. Don't have the side conversations mm -hmm. because that doesn't really help the process. Sean? Yeah, I, I um, from my biased view, it's about the strength of the search chair. Um, mm -hmm. And really the selection of the search chair especially when an executive search firm helps make or break the search. Um, and so making sure that search chair is trained, making sure they're comfortable and they're ready to call out behaviors mm -hmm. um, in the, in this, either the search committee meeting or things that, that, that develop. Cause if they're not, and if, if the culture begins to build that it's a little more laxed, that will continue to carry through. Mm -hmm. um, and so that strength of the search chair or co-chairs, we could talk, we could have a whole webinar on the different, whether mm -hmm. co-chairs is a good idea or not, but, um, you know, it's really kind of focused in on um, making sure you're selecting good people um, that really want to have that role um, and are willing to put the time and effort into, into having a good search. All right, I'm going to ask you a loaded question, but tell you both you got to keep your remarks on this one short because this is another one that could take us down a, uh, a rabbit hole and there's a few more in the queue I want to get to. So this is this is an interesting one. We all know the consultative, the importance of the consultative process in higher ed and, and getting buy in and participation, which is partly what we do through our search committee process. The question for Frederica is, are, have there been conversations among HR professionals in SHRM or Coupe HR groups or, or wherever about search committees and the potential barriers they present to the search process? Yes, sir, has. <laughs> um, and I think, again, that comes back to conversations about expectations, mm -hmm. uh, not only of the search committee, but of the university. And what is our goal in moving forward so that you, you, you deal with those barriers openly, but we also set expectations and parameters in my opinion, set that from the beginning. And, and we do have conversations and sometimes you have to come back, but you know, what were our goals? Expectations and parameters, great advice. Clear is kind, right? Sean, anything to weigh in on that in the national stage, conversations about the search committee process? Yeah, I think um, from an executive search standpoint, it's going back to what Frederica is mimicking on campus, which is nimble mm -hmm. um, and trying to have a nimble process, a nimble search committee that maybe can do the burden in the hand recruiting or is prepared to think about credentials differently or, you know, so how do we know the more credentials and requirements we make, the narrower the pool gets. Right. And so what is our honest conversation? Um, you know, what does appointing with tenure or, you know, what's the rank or status, years of experience, um, having, you know, search committees that are willing to engage on those with their HR partners when they design those profiles. Um, so I think that the challenge isn't so much the behavior during the search committee, but again, it's back to Frederica's, when we set it up, are we setting up the search for success? Right. Another question um, from an attendee saying um, he or she would love to see the, the interview process shortened to do a day or less and bring people in once they're selected. What are the drawbacks you see in part of this um, challenge in this particular campus is that they're in a rural community? So, so for us, um, we have shortened that process, but it's a lot of work of communication beforehand to make sure they're engaged. Uh, with that, we're now only bringing the finalists. We're doing everything Zoom. However, being nimble, I lost the internet <laughs> right there. Being nimble, understanding us and the um, search, uh, the candidate could have some issues. But keeping that communication going, sharing information. Right now in this day and age, if you go, you have candidates that are viable candidates and you don't talk to them <laughs> every couple days, while you're working through this, they mm -hmm. may not be your candidate because others, if you think they're good and they're looking, others think they're good. Mm -hmm. Have you changed? I, Sorry, Sean, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, I, I think the challenge from our side is not the, the window, we can talk about the interview window frames, but the length of time between selection 
and finalist interviews. Mm, that's the biggest. And multiple. how do we get due diligence in there, mm -hmm. um, and get them to campus and get the decision made, and kind of it, it's a rapid fire succession at that point. And so you know, working with our HR partners on the search to how do we how do we get a transition to campus as fast as we can mm -hmm. without losing the ability to do a really thorough Our deep work. dive on the due diligence. Excellent. Frederica, I think you commented on this earlier. Have you changed the length of your required job posting application period for faculty and staff positions, narrowing it to expedite and yeah. model that nimb nimbleness? So we've done a lot of open until filled, but have a review date. Mm -hmm. in there so that we're working on processing just in case candidates pull out so that has been a majority ours of our postings are now open until filled Excellent. Um, to a but you have right set up because we put right in the posting that initial review date so that candidates know we are moving quickly excellent so we're coming down to the top of the hour and um, we'll be wrapping up any final tidbits, thoughts, words of wisdom, hiring managers, candidates in search of their next position that either of you would like to share as we as we wind down or both of you. I would just say that we have to be open to new ideas and changes because this is changing so much. Um, you have to be willing to try something different to get the candidate and have different conversations and different expectations. But you've got to bring people along with you mm -hmm. uh, with that. You, you do have to bring them along and, and no surprises. Great, great words of advice, Sean. I, you know, I, I keep coming back to this, be kind to yourself, mm -hmm. uh, be kind to others. Um, and the grace that we need to kind of move through these challenges. Um, when when I talk to a hiring authority now, it is not if something is going to pop up during the search. The question is what is likely to pop up during the search and how do we as a team effectively move through it um, and minimize its impact on the search? Because it's just that the, all the challenges and the issues we talked about at the beginning kind of rear their heads in, in different ways. And so finding that way to be nimble, to be gracious, to be good to ourselves and our candidates is really finding that, you know, finding that mix, which I think for a lot of us is a little elusive right now. Yeah, so much uncertainty. We've certainly d discovered a new uh, skill in our leadership competencies about um, managing with uncertainty that we never knew that we had. Uh, so thank you, Sean. Thank you, Frederica. This has been a wonderful conversation. Um, great insights, great tips and best practices. Um, a big heartfelt thanks to our partners in academic search mm -hmm. for their ongoing support of Ask You and all of our member campuses mm -hmm. and all of the higher ed community and your commitment to leadership development and diversity. So thank you. And, and um, we couldn't be more, uh, we couldn't do what we do without the partnership that we received from academic search. Thank you to everyone who joined us today. And those of you um, that want to pass on along. This will be part of our Ask You's On Demand library, so the recorded session will be posted within a few days. We'll be happy to share the deck that was shared um, with you, so I'll pass that along and any, any other resources that we think would be valuable as you navigate this um, crazy time um, in higher education. As a reminder, part two of our session, and oh, please take a moment to tell us how we did in today's conversation. Um, part two of our conversation on um, the higher ed landscape will take place next Wednesday, May 11th, also at 2 p.m. Eastern time. That session also will be recorded. We'll be joined by Dr. Andy Brantley, the CEO of Coupa HR, and Dr. Cynthia Teniente Matson president of Texas A&M San Antonio. We'll focus more in this conversation about workforce trends and issues and different challenges shaping higher ed workforce in ways that leaders can do a better job in retaining and engaging the talent needed today and into the future. So we will look forward to seeing you all next week. And again, thanks to our speakers and to all of you for being with us today. We welcome your feedback and look forward to seeing you again.